Well, if you have your copy of God's Word with you, would you turn with me to the book of Lamentations? Lamentations. And if you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 471 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be in Lamentations chapter 3. If you're finding that, let me just express my word of thanks on behalf of Parker and Dave. It's been a joy to get to preach a little bit more often this summer. Uh, I know you don't get to hear from the rest of the elders as much throughout the year, so thanks for, for putting up with us and everything. It's been a joy to get to, uh, to labor over the scriptures and get you, uh, to get to preach the word. It is a great and terrifying privilege uh, to preach the word of God. And so, as you find Lamentations chapter 3, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? This morning... My focus will be verses 22 to 24, but I'm going to read the first 33 verses of chapter 3 to give us some better context. Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand. Again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me, enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He's blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He's made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He's made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I become the laughing stock of all peoples. The object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has saved me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereaved of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction. And my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheeks to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he causes grief, he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Imagine with me, if you will, a future. A future where a foreign army invades our lands. And they, as they invade, they, they cut off all of our resources. Beginning with our food, our water, our communications, and our internet and social media. I know that one hurts a lot more with our younger generation. They've they've cut it all off. Anything of value or benefit is gone. As time goes on, many people die of starvation. People become desperate for food. And of course, the first thing to go will be the family pet. 
But as time goes on, people, the depravity of man will become more and more apparent. And no doubt some people will even resort to cannibalism. People are driven to despair and hopelessness. No doubt many will take their lives to escape. We're weakened to the point of defeat until finally we are defeated by this foreign enemy and we surrender. Now let's just think in Lawton alone. They destroy Fort Sill. They destroy every government building. Every church is torn down. Every house in Lawton burned to the ground. Till there's nothing left. No resources, no protection, just ruins and rubble. Many people have already died because there was nothing to eat, but now many people are killed. But it doesn't end there. Many others are taken off to this foreign land as slaves. Are are you still imagining with me? Because quite frankly, I'm going to be honest with you, it's hard for us to imagine this, isn't it? Just even the thought of not having any food is hard for us to imagine. We are so spoiled, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. You look in the fridge, there, by, by some miracle, there's nothing in the fridge. What do we do? Well, we go to the store. And even if there's no food at the store, there's food at the store, isn't there? I mean, come on. There's that food that you don't want to eat. Nobody wants to eat it, but it's there at the store. There's food at the store, isn't there? Might not be the stuff we want to eat, but it's there. Okay, so we don't get that food at the store. What do we do? We'll pick up something in the drive-thru on our way home. We'll get food from elsewhere. See, it's hard for us even to wrap our minds around this. In this scenario, there's no food anywhere. None at the store. You can't go go through the drive-thru and get, get some food there. There's nothing. And then as we, as we carry on in this, this, this test of our imagination, we can't even imagine another army coming in and defeating us and destroying the whole city. We, we have trouble imagining this whole scenario. Yet, if something like this were to happen, it would be absolutely devastating. It, it would be devastating to say the least. We would, if we were to experience this firsthand, if we were left alive, we would just sit there in shock, traumatized by what we've seen and experienced. Now, I run you through this exercise in imagination to just point out that this is similar to what happened to the people of Judah. In 587 BC, the Babylonians invaded. And it was an absolutely horrific event. And to experience such an event would cause any person to lose hope. You would sit there traumatized and hopeless. Waiting for the horrible nightmare to to wake up from this horrible nightmare. Only to discover you can't wake up from it because you're already awake. Now a few weeks ago we we looked in the book of Zephaniah. We read from Zephaniah chapter 3 and we saw the joy of being part of God's people. That the gospel gives joy and that the the people of God, his love for them drives out fear. But also in that book, Zephaniah prophesied that the day of the Lord was coming. A day whenever God would bring judgment upon the nation of Judah because of their idolatry. He, He was going to allow another nation to come in and overthrow them. God had been very patient and long-suffering towards Judah, yet they continued in their idolatry. They continued following their wicked kings and doing what was not right in the eyes of the Lord. And decades after Zephaniah's prophecy, in 587 B.C., God allowed Jerusalem to fall to King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And the warfare that was used in that day against fortified cities was, was called that they laid siege to the city. Or they besieged the city. Which means the Babylonians, they came and they encircled Jerusalem. And they cut off all their resources. All of their food, their water, anything of value or benefit. Nothing was going in or coming out of the city. So that all the Babylonians would have to do is just wait 
as the people would get weaker and weaker and die of hunger. As time goes on, what would happen? They, they would run out of food. They would become desperate and eat whatever they could find. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we're told of another time that a city was besieged. The Syrians besieged Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. In, in 2 Kings 6, we're told of how horrific it was. People became so def- desperate that they, became, they began selling donkey heads and dove dung for food. I can guarantee none of us have ever been that hungry, that desperate. But they were. We're even told at one point that parents even ate their children. They were so desperate. And here is the Babylonians are besieging Jerusalem. This siege lasted for one and a half years. And in 2 Kings 25, we're told that the siege was so extreme that there was no food for the people. And finally, a hole was made in the wall and the king tried to escape with his sons but was quickly caught. His sons were executed before his eyes and then his eyes were put out. And he was taken away in chains to Babylon. They burned the house of the Lord. They destroyed the king's palace. They burned all the houses in Jerusalem and they destroyed the walls of the city. Already, many people have died, but many people were killed. Many people were taken off to Babylon in exile and only some of the poorest were left behind in the rubble and ashes. This was absolute devastation. It's horrific and traumatic. In the Old Testament, there's a small book that gives an eyewitness account of what it was like to live through this. And that is the book of Lamentations. This book, it it tells us of what happened here. What it was like. While Zephaniah prophesied that judgment was coming for Judah, Zephaniah prophesied that Lamentation gives the account that judgment has been carried out. It's happening now. Now, in Hebrew, in Hebrew, the book of Lamentations is actually entitled uh, Eka, which means how, which is an appropriate title. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, all begin with this word, how. And the author of this book keeps, keeps asking the question, how, which is a right question to ask. How the city sits silent. And as you read this, you can't help but ask, how could... God, allow this to happen. How, how, how? Now many believe that Jeremiah was the author of this book. And there's good evidence for that, but many others believe that this was written by a number of different authors over over a course of many years. In the end, we don't know for sure who wrote the book of Lamentations. We don't have an exact author. But we know this, that this is a first author. First-hand eyewitness account. And this book is a testament to the fact that God keeps His promises. Now when we hear that, we think, yes and amen, God keeps His promises. But we're usually thinking about His promises of blessing. And He does, amen, He does keep His promises of blessing. But He also keeps His promises of judgment. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Uh, Chapter 28, before the Israelites were about to enter the promised land that God was giving to them, Moses told them, he told them this message from God that if they will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And listen to some of these curses. He says, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And your dead body shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And there shall be no one to frighten them away. God promises them that if they do not obey, they will lose the land that he's giving to them. He will allow them to be overtaken. 
He goes on to promise them, your families will be taken away. Your sons and daughters will be taken away. Husbands, your wives will be taken by other men. You shall become a horror, a proverb, a byword among all the peoples. He's promising them. In Deuteronomy 28, he promises, if you obey, it will bring blessing. But if you disobey, it will bring curses. If you continue in disobedience, you will lose the land. Well, the Israelites did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. They went after other gods. They acted like the pagan nations around them. And as a result, God allowed the Babylonians to invade and destroy them. And we, we see that it's not just God allowing the Babylonians to do this. God is acting against them. God is acting against Jerusalem. And all throughout chapter 3, I don't know if you noticed this as we were reading, but the author is telling how God is dealing with them. It is God doing this. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. He has made my flesh and skin waste away. He has broken my bones. God is doing this. God is carrying out judgment. And it's devastating. It's even to the point where in verse 18 the author says, My endurance has perished. So is my hope from the Lord. I got nothing left. He's at the end of his rope. Yet God does not bring such affliction for no reason. He does not afflict from his heart. He does not delight in bringing pain, but he has a plan and purpose for it. He does not abandon his people. There we read just a moment ago in verse 31, where the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to his, the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. God has a plan and purpose even in the midst of his judgment. Now it's really easy for us to, to read the events of the fall of Jerusalem and exile in Babylon and be disconnected from it. But I challenge you this morning, I plead with you this morning to, to be engaged here. To understand that what's being described in Lamentations is real events happening to real people. People starved to death. A ruthless foreign enemy came in and invaded. Parents had children taken from their arms. And even killed before their eyes. Children watched their parents slaughtered before them. The place of worship, the place where they, they, they came together to, to meet with God and worship Him, is destroyed. Their homes left in ashes. Listen to this eyewitness account. Turn, turn to chapter 2, verse 20. Listen to this. The author cries out to the Lord and says, Look, O Lord, see, with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb? See, the, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. We can't even begin to imagine going through something like this. How? How could something like this happen? How could God allow this? How could anyone go on after experiencing this? How? What, what hope could anyone have in such dark times as these? Yet right in the middle of this book, right in the middle of these lamentations, the author shows us the source of hope in the midst of hopelessness. The point of the book of lamentations is not merely to lament in grief. Yes, this book is filled with lamentations and is called that for obvious reasons. But it's so much more than just laments. 
Mark Dever explains, Lamentations was written, you see, not simply to express grief over loss, as one might think from its title, Lamentations. It was written to help God's people, including the author himself, cope with loss and the temptation to despair by reminding them of God's presence in his rule. Like Job, Lamentations is a theodicy. That is, it helps people to see God's goodness and power amidst suffering. Although the book was written so many years ago to people far away, this book is so relevant and important to us today. This book was written for our encouragement and instruction. We might never experience anything like what the people of Judah experienced in the fall of Jerusalem. But some of us may and or will experience dark days of pain and suffering and sorrow that leave us wanting to just be hopeless. In some form of another, we will all experience suffering. And in those days when hope seems to be fainting, how do we endure? What enables us to hope? Lamentations chapter 3 calls us to remember the character of God in the midst of those dark days. Because it is here. It is is the character and nature of God. This is where our hope is found. And my goal in preaching this passage this morning is to help prepare you for when those dark days come. Because they will. And though your world caves in, may you see from the Scriptures how you can stand firm clinging to the reality that God is good and He has not and He will not change. And if you are here this morning and you are not turning from your sin and trusting in Christ, my hope and prayer is that as you hear the truth of God's Word, you, your heart will be open to the Gospel and you will put your hope in God to save you. So this morning... As we look at Lamentations chapter 3, we're going to look at four truths concerning the character of God that should give us hope. Four truths concerning God's character that should give us hope. Look back in verse 18. Verse 18, he, he says, My endurance has perished, so is my hope from the Lord. He, he, his hope is lost. The author is defeated and he's got nothing left. And yet as you go to verse 19 to 21, he begins talking about memory. He, he brings up remembering three times. He, he, verse 19, remembers. Remember his, his affliction and wandering, the wormwood and the gall, the bitterness of what's happened. So he looks around. Verse 20, my soul continually remembers it. He can't escape it. It's all around him. All he has to do is open his eyes and he automatically remembers It's that bad dream that you can't wake up from. But then verse 21, he remembers it. He calls, but this I call to mind. Now when he says, but this I call to mind, he's not referring to everything else he was just remembering. He's not referring to the affliction and the pain and the suffering and sorrows. He's remembering what he's about to talk about. He calls this to mind. He remembers the character of God as we see in 22 to 24. And as a result of this, he has hope. The character of God, this is the source of our hope. And it has to be. We, we, our character cannot be the source of our hope. The character of others can't be the source of our hope. We are, we are horrible saviors. And other people are horrible saviors. We are, in, we are fallible and will wreck it. We need an unchanging person. An unchanging Savior who is infallible. And if the source of your hope is found in anything or anyone other than God, it will ultimately fail. So let's look together here at verse 22 to 24. Let's look at these four truths concerning the character of God that should give us hope. Number one is this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His steadfast love never... How can the author write that? Is he contradicting himself here? Because he has just been writing about how God is is carrying out judgment upon them. 
And it's been devastating. They are left in ruins. But yet the author, he can rightly proclaim the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Because of God's steadfast love, God did not completely destroy them. He did not cut off the remnant. And it's from the remnant, this this small group of people he has left, that the Messiah will come. God is so mercifully gracious that as bad as bad as things are, they are not worse. He did not completely destroy his people. Walter Kaiser comments and he says, the proof that God still graciously loved his suffering people could be seen in the fact that they were not consumed. At the heart of this triumphant affirmation is the word above all other Old Testament Hebrew words symbolizing God's grace. Has said. In essence, has said is just the Old Testament way of saying God is gracious, God is love. His said is God's loving kindness, His merciful, unfailing love towards His covenant people. It's His steadfast love. When God revealed Himself to Moses in Exodus 34, He, he proclaimed this as He passed by. Exodus 34, 6, He proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Abounding in His said. He loves his covenant people so much that even in judgment, he does not completely destroy them. He does not consume them. He still shows them mercy and grace. He is abounding in steadfast love towards them. And it is because God has said that he is in covenant with this people. He, he doesn't love the people because he's in covenant with them. He loves them and therefore He's made a covenant with them that that He will be their God and they will be His people. And He will not break covenant with them. Uh, Marriage is is this picture of this covenant relationship that God has with His people. This, This picture of the husband loving his life and giving his life for his bride just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. In fact, marriage is this picture, this parable of this covenantal love that God has for His people. Even though they have been very unfaithful to Him, God will remain faithful to them because His has said, His steadfast love, it, it never ceases. He never stops loving them. He loves His people and He will never stop. Malachi 3.6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. It is because of His unchanging character and His steadfast love, they are not consumed. It's because of this love that we are not consumed. I mean, when you... Did you wake up this morning amazed that you woke up? Well, you should have. I mean... We have a toddler in our house right now, so it's easy. Some of y'all, it's really easy to get this. It's a miracle that that our toddlers are growing and reaching to later ages in life and that we're not wiping them off the face of the earth. Toddlers are God's illustration to us (laughs) of his steadfast love, that he has not wiped us out. These toddlers, they are just a little... Little illustrations for us, reminding us of God's steadfast love towards us and His long-suffering and patience towards us. Because the reality is we should have been consumed long ago. Because we have all sinned against this holy God over and over and over. The Puritan George Swinnock, he wrote, Sin lays the honor of this incomparable God, which is more than millions of worlds lies it in the dust and tramples on it. Instead of praising and honoring God as we have been created to do, we disobey and we try to disgrace God through our actions. We lay His honor in the dust and we trample upon it. And every day of our lives, we we sin against this, this wonderfully great, incomparable God. One of the prayers of the Valley of Vision puts it like this. No day of my life has passed that has not proved me guilty in thy sight. 
Prayers have been uttered from prayerless hearts. Praise has often been praiseless sound. My best services are filthy, filthy rags. All things in me call for my rejection. How are we not consumed? How has God not destroyed us? Well, it's because Christ was consumed in our place. He bore our punishment. He was consumed in our stead. The sinless Son of God went to the cross and the full wrath of God was poured out on Him in our place. And God demonstrated His love, His own love for His people. He demonstrated His steadfast love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And all of our sin, past, present, and future, has been paid for through the finished work of Christ. So Christian, behold, behold the steadfast love of the Lord. Look to the cross and see it and be amazed and praise the Lord for his, his said that he that never ends, that has been put on full display at the cross, his love for you. And because of his steadfast love, you have not been consumed. And today, if you are here and you're not turning from your sin and trusting in Christ alone to save you and make you right with God, Behold this great love and come to Christ. See how Jesus, he's come and lived the perfect life that we have failed to live. He never trampled the honor of God in the dust like we have. He never sinned. He's given his life as the perfect substitute in the place of sinners. And he is risen from the dead and he, now he sits on his throne interceding as our great high priest for all who will come to him by faith. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ. Do not continue in your rebellion. For if you continue in your sin and do not trust in Christ, you will be consumed by the wrath of God. Trust in Christ and experience the steadfast love of the Lord. The next characteristic of God that gives us hope that we see is there still the end of verse 22. It's that the Lord's mercies never end. Look there again, verse 22. His mercies, it doesn't say that his mercy never comes to an end. It says his mercies. It's plural. It's it's referring to his compassion, his goodness, his grace, his love. Matthew Henry comments, he said, he said, here are mercies in the plural number, denoting abundance and variety of those mercies. God is an inexhaustible fountain of mercy. He's the father of mercies. Note, we, we, owe, we all owe it to the sparing mercy of God that we are not consumed Others have been consumed around about us. And we ourselves have been in the consuming. And yet we are not consumed. We are out of the grave. We are out of hell. Had we been dealt with according to our sins, we should have been consumed long ago. But we have been dealt with according to God's mercies. And we are bound to acknowledge it to his praise. Praise God for his mercies. Think for a moment with me about these mercies. Think about the fact that the Lord, He is compassionate. Deuteronomy 4.31 For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that He swore to them. Puritan Thomas Goodwin wrote, he said, Says God, all that you know by me is that I will save poor sinners. That I delight in mercy. I care not who knows this love that he, he delights to show mercy he delights in saving poor sinners the lord is compassionate towards pitiful helpless sinners like us the, the book of jonah is such a beautiful illustration of how compassionate god is Th think about the story of jonah god has compassion upon the people of nineveh so what does he do he sends a, a prophet to go to them well, this prophet, he is a wayward prophet, so he doesn't go immediately. So what does he do? He boards a, a ship with pagan sailors. 
Well, God is so compassionate. He has compassion upon these pagan sailors that he put the wayward prophet on the boat with them. There'd be a storm. They'd toss him overboard. And what would end up happening? They would come to know and worship this great God. The wayward prophet gets swallowed by a big fish. He's in... It's going to be in the digestive tract of this big fish, so God has compassion upon him and causes the fish to vomit him up onto the shore. Now, to some, that might not sound compassionate, but it really is. God has compassion upon Nineveh, these people that are, that are worshiping false gods living in darkness, and he sends the wayward prophet once more and calls them to repent. God has compassion upon Jonah while he sits in the heat waiting and watching for Nineveh to be destroyed. God has compassion and causes a plant to grow to give him some shade. Nobody in this story deserves grace. Everyone in the story is a bad person. They're they're pagans, they're idolaters, they're, they're, they're rebellious. They're all bad people here. And they're all helpless and they are doomed. But what do we see? Compassion, compassion, compassion. The Lord has compassion upon these these pitiful, helpless people that are doomed on their own. And the Lord looks upon us and what does He have? Compassion. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. The Lord is compassionate. The Lord, he's compassionate. He's also good. We heard last week, Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statues. The Lord, he is good. Everything that he does is good. Stephen Charnock says, he points out, that this is not a habit added to God's essence, but His essence itself. God is good. It's who He is. It's who He is. It's what He does. All goodness in creation is simply mirroring the goodness found in God. He is the fountain of all goodness. He is the foundation of all goodness. He is the standard of all goodness. We wouldn't know what goodness is apart from God. We can know what good is because God is good. Arthur Pink puts it like this. He says, God is infinitely good. The creature's good is but a drop. But in God there is an infinite ocean or a gathering together of good. He's eternally and immutably good for He cannot be less than good that He is. As there is no addition made to Him, no subtraction from Him. God is the chiefest good. He is the goodest good, if you will. He overflows with goodness towards His creation, especially towards His people. He is benevolent and kind in His dealings with us. He is so good that He works all things providentially. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He works all things in our lives together for our good. And Romans 8, 29 tells us what that good is. It's that those whom he foreknew would be predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This good God works all things together for the good of his people so that they would be made good like he is good. His goodness and the goodness of his plans and purposes, they never end. He is ever good. And the psalmist, David, he gives this invitation in Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. You know why they lack no good thing? Because they have Him. And and He is infinitely good. His compassion, His goodness, His steadfast love, they never come to an end. His mercies, they never run out. His mercies for His people will never stop. 
So dive into the ocean. Dive into the depths of the ocean of his mercies and you will never reach the bottom. This morning, let me ask you, are you here today? And are you struggling with sin? Are you beat down and discouraged from yesterday's failures? Do you sin and you think, that was it. He must be done with me. It must, it must have run out. There's, there's no more forgiveness left. Well, let me first off say, we're glad you're here this morning because you're among fellow sinners. But be encouraged today by this truth that the Lord's mercies towards you will never stop. They won't run out. His mercies are like this mighty flowing river that never lets up and never dries up. Even when he disciplines his people, like what we're seeing here in Lamentations, even as he's bringing about this judgment, his compassions and his goodness and love, they don't stop. His steadfast love and his mercies, they are new every morning. And it's not that God is creating new steadfast love and new mercies every day, but rather they are fresh and renewed daily. Even though his mercies are of old, they're ever fresh and ever new. Paul David Tripp, he wrote this, he said, One of the stunning realities of the Christian life is that in a world where everything is in some state of decay, God's mercies will never grow old. They never run out. They are never ill-timed. They never dry up. They never grow weak. They never get weary. They never fail to meet the need. They never disappoint. They never ever fail because they really are new every morning. Every morning when we wake up, we experience the mercy and grace of God fresh again. He did not destroy us because of yesterday's failures. He did not leave us during the night. We, we wake to find him holding us fast and reminding us again that he loves us and his love for us will not end. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. This leads us to the third characteristic of God. Number three, that great is the faithfulness of God. Come back to Jerusalem. Once again, come sit in the rubble and remains with the author here. As he's looking around at the remains of his beloved city, we can, we can imagine him just sitting in shock there after witnessing the things that he's seen. And it would be so easy to just sit there, just lie over and wait for death. To just give up. To live out whatever life is left in hopeless despair. He's at the end of his rope, yet he calls this to mind. That the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. The character and nature of God have not failed. God has not quit being God. He has not abandoned his people. He has not neglected the covenant. There is still hope in the darkness. Because God is faithful. Therefore, the author can rightly proclaim, great is your faithfulness. God is more faithful than the morning sun. We can be sure that tomorrow the sun will rise. But you can be even more sure that God is faithful and will continue loving his people and pouring out his mercies upon them. He is so faithful that Jesus, in Revelation 19, he's called faithful and true. God is so faithful that the psalmist declares in Psalm 36, 5, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Spurgeon said, Far, far above all comprehension is the truth and faithfulness of God. He never fails, nor forgets, nor falters, nor forfeits his word. In Numbers chapter 23, it, said, uh, it says, God is not man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? 
Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? He is faithful. He's faithful to himself. He's faithful to keep his word. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his people. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. The hope of our salvation is found in the faithfulness of God. Titus 1-2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before ages began. If God is not faithful, we have no hope for Him to keep His promises, to save us and keep us. But God is in fact faithful. He's trustworthy. He will keep His word. He is faithful in saving and keeping his people. I want you to take a moment. I did this yesterday. I just sat down. I took a piece of paper and I just began thinking about the past 13, just the past 13 years. I just began to write down where I could see God's faithfulness in my life as I thought about what all had transpired. I want to encourage you to do the same. To just think about your life. To think about how the Lord has brought you to this place where you are right now. Think about that through the many dangers, toils, and snares, how he has brought you to this place. Examine closely and you will find the hand of providence guiding, keeping, and sustaining you. From big life choices and decisions to unnoticed day-to-day provisions. And I hope that you will reach the same place that the author reached, the same place that I reached by the end of the paper. That all you can do is just cry out, great is your faithfulness. You know, there are many hymns that have been written from big life experiences. The obvious one, of course, is It Is Well With My Soul. The story of Horatio Spafford and how he he lost his daughters in, in a shipwreck. And he penned that great hymn. However, the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness by Thomas Chisholm, that hymn that we sang earlier, it was not written because of a major life event, but rather it was written after a lifetime of experiencing the faithfulness of God. Before, shortly before Chisholm's death, he wrote, My income has never been large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me until now. But I must not fail to record here The unfailing faithfulness of God, of a covenant-keeping God, that He is giving me many wonderful displays of His providing care, which has filled me with with astonishing gratefulness. As you look back, may you see His providential care and provision, and may you give Him praise. May you proclaim, great is thy faithfulness. In light of the context of this passage, the agony and pain that the author experienced, it makes the passage even more incredible. This man, he experienced such horrific suffering, yet he didn't didn't abandon his hope in God. Instead, he worshipped and praised the God of faithfulness. The faithfulness of God is foundational for our hope. We can, we can have unshakable hope in God in the darkest of times because of His steadfast love, His never-ending mercies, because of His great faithfulness. And this leads to fourth and finally, that the Lord is our portion. In light of all of this, in light of God's steadfast love and mercy and faithfulness, the author proclaims, the Lord is my portion. He's making this declaration, God is my inheritance. This language is similar to Numbers 18 where God, He allots the land to the people of Israel as they come into the promised land. And He gives them different parts of the land as their inheritance. But to the Levites, to the priests, He doesn't give them any land. He, instead, He tells them, He tells Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in the land, neither shall you have any portion in any of them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. Instead of getting land, the priests, the Levites, they got something infinitely better. God was their inheritance. Well, looking back here in verse 24, 
He says, the Lord is my inheritance, says my soul. From the depths of his being, he's proclaiming, God is my inheritance. He is my treasure. Though he's suffered the loss of of everything, he still has everything in God. God is his exceedingly great reward. How can we rejoice in the midst of suffering and sorrow? How can we rejoice in the midst of loss? How can we press on when we are beaten down into despair? We must come to the place of seeing that the Lord, He is our portion. He is the source of our hope, joy, and peace. Our contentment is found in Him alone. Earthly inheritances and treasures can be taken away and destroyed. Parents, your children, if they are your greatest treasure, what happens when when they're taken from you? What happens if, if you lose a child? If your wealth is your greatest treasure, what happens when, when, when you lose it all, when you go broke and have nothing left? If, if your health is your greatest treasure, what happens when you get sick from illness and do not recover back to full health? There is only one treasure that cannot be taken, one treasure that will not fade, one treasure that will never disappoint or be lost or stolen, and it is the Lord. He is the inheritance of His people. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is an infinite, inexhaustible, all-sufficient, satisfying portion. Is this God, is He your portion? Is He your great treasure? Once again, George Swinnick, he, he poses the question, or he says, if this God be such an incomparable God, then choose this God to be your portion and take Him for your happiness. Don't put your hope in lesser things. They will fail and leave you empty, but come to this God whose steadfast love never ceases and mercies never end. Make Him your portion. This all results in hope. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in Him. Though I lose everything else, I have hope. When the Lord is your portion, you can proclaim what with Habakkuk from Habakkuk 3. Though the fig tree fail, should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines... The produce of the olive tree and fields yield no fruit. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer. He makes me tread the high places. Lamentations chapter 3. These verses we've seen here is such a wonderful passage to remind us the character of God. And it should give us hope. It should cause us to worship Him for who He's revealed Himself to be. But let me remind you of something. that This passage, it's not the end of Lamentations. After He says this, there's more suffering and sorrow in the book. There's more bad things that take place after we read this. And the last verse of this book ends with a plea. If you turn to the very end of Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 5, verse 21 and 22 says, it says, plea to God, restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and remain exceedingly angry with us. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, that doesn't sound like a, Like a nice, optimistic, hopeful end to the book of Lamentations. But the reality is, there is great hope in these words. God will restore and renew His people. God will not utterly reject them and remain exceedingly angry with them. Because He will send a Savior who will come and suffer the full penalty of the sins of God's people. They will not be rejected because the Lord will reject Him instead. He will not cut off and condemn them because 
He will cut off and condemn His Son in their place at the cross. The Lord will not pour out His holy righteous anger upon them because it will be poured out upon Christ. You see, there is hope. And this hope is ultimately found in Christ and in His finished work. So I plead with you today to look to Jesus and find your hope here. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ. He is the portion worth having. He is the treasure worth giving everything up for. The person who receives Jesus as his treasure has everything. He has the greatest of portions. So come to Christ today. Receive him as your portion. The reality of life is that every one of us will suffer in some form or another. Sickness will take away our health or the health of our loved ones. Famine and the wickedness of man will rob us of earthly possessions. Death will strike. Loss of a child. Loss of a spouse, a loved one, a friend. Overwhelming sorrows. Persecution will come. Lose, lose our jobs, lose our Friends and relatives, because of following Christ, even losing our lives. Yet when these trials and sufferings and sorrows come, we must cling to the hope and we must cling to the character and nature of God. Because this is the foundation of our hope. He is unchanging. So find your hope here. And when these sufferings and sorrows come, we can proclaim together that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. The Lord is our portion, says our souls. Therefore, we will hope in Him. Let's pray together. Lord, you are good. Even in times whenever we, we go through sorrows and sadness and, and suffering, you are still good. You do not change. Help us to cling to the truth and promises of your word. Help us to cling to your revelation of your unchanging, unfailing character and nature. And may our hope be unshaken because it is in this. May we continually be calling this to our minds. Lord, now as we leave this place, prepare our hearts to go and to make you, this great God, known to others so that more people may find you as their portion. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for your great faithfulness and love. Amen.